You now do the, you hybridize the two true breeds to produce an F1 offspring, and all the F1s, both female and male, look the same. Okay? They have normal eyes and normal wings because they're all heterozygous now. They inherited from this from mother here at least one dominant purple eye color gene and the vestigial wing gene. The other one they got from recessive dad here. Okay, but they're heterozygous and we have complete dominance. Okay? So it's a Mendel cross. Okay. Now we're going to cross these to make an F2 generation. Okay? Actually, we're not going to do that. What, gonna, what, the, what his team did, this was done by one of his students called Sturdivant, 1913. What's going to happen next is Sturdivant is going to do a, a back cross, a test cross. Okay? He's going to back cross, in the next slide here. He's going to back cross the female, the wild, the heterozygous female, back with the recessive male. This is like Mendel's test cross. You took the F1 heterozygous individuals and back cross the recessive individuals to reveal the genotype. So it's a test cross. So you're back crossing the daughter with her father. Ooh, that's weird. So you can't do this with humans. Well, you could, but you can be present. Fruit flies, they don't care. I guess. I, mean, I don't know. I've never ask a fruit fly. Maybe they would care. They may have morals too. Who knows? Now, if you're a maggot, you don't have any morals. <laughs> I mean, you call someone a maggot because they have no morals, right? Okay. I, that's an aside. Let me get back to work here. Let me, let me back up one more time here. So we've got two true breeding flies here. These double mutants. Produce the F1s. All the F1s are heterozygous for both the purple gene and the vestigial wing gene. You then take the uh, heterozygous female back cross over the recessive pair, which is the male here. Okay. And remember in the back cross of Mendel, let's, let's, re let's review the back cross that Mendel did to confirm his F1s were heterozygous, just to show you about that. Okay. If, we, if we take a heterozygous dihybrid individual pea plant and back cross it with the heterozygous recessive, so round yellow seeds, back cross with wrinkled green seeds. Remember, these look just like the true breeding parent. They look exactly identical to the true breeding parental generation. You can't tell them apart. If you back cross them with a recessive parent, you can identify the genotype, right? Right? Because you would expect, in this case, from, a, from this back cross, we look at all the possible wheels here from this parent, Four sex cells. They can make this. His parent can only make one set of sex cells. We would expect in the back cross, this this uh, would expect uh, this genotype, this genotype, this genotype, and this genotype. We have round yellow. We have round green. We have uh, wrinkled yellow and wrinkled green. If you remember back to Mendel's original dihybrid cross, the P generation was that cross there. These are the parental types, right? And the back cross, here's the parental type here. Round yellow, green wrinkled. There's a parental type there. That's a parental type. This is a parental type here, wrinkled green, right? These are what we call recombinants. They're, they're new combinations of traits, right? Because in, in the true breeding history, you had round, yellow, wrinkled, green. You didn't have brown, green, or wrinkled, yellow. But in the test cross, you get those guys because of independent assortment. And the ratio is one to one to one to one. That's what, that's what they expected to see. A one to one ratio in the test cross. You with me so far? Okay? But that's not what they found. So you do the back cross. The heterozygous female with the homozygous recessive male, there's the, just like I did, the four sex cells produced by this parent, the one of that parent there, okay? 
You would expect if these two sets of genes sort independently that you should have a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio here. They recovered, Sturdivant recovered 2,839 offspring of this back cross. If you expect that independent assortment, you should have a one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one. you should have these numbers, right? That divided by four. But what he got instead was mostly the parental types, wild type, and the, but you got and very few of these recombinant versions. Why? Okay. Remember when we talked about independent assortment at metaphase one, it's because different genes are riding on different chromosomes. Depending on whether you inherit the paternal chromosome of chromosome two or the maternal chromosome uh, of chromosome three together, or whether you get paternals or maternal maternal combinations, it does, they're all, are, all are likely, equally likely to independent assortment. And in that case, you should have equal numbers here. But they got mostly parental types and very few recombinants. So the way they explain this is say, well, these two genes are not assorted independently. Where independent assortment says, doesn't matter which of these alleles I inherit, won't influence which of these alleles I inherit. That's independent assortment. Dependent assortment says, if I inherit a wild type allele, this and I should most likely get that one instead. Because they're on the same chromosome. They're linked. So this is the discovery of linked genes. And that makes sense. If you've got, in the human genome, 23 chromosomes and over 20,000 genes, each chromosome's got to carry more than one gene. And so genes in the same chromosome are more likely to be inherited together, not sorted independently, as compared to those on separate chromosomes. And the closer they are, the same chromosome, the more likely they can inherit and link together. Okay, because what can separate chromosome, what can separate genes in the same chromosome from each other? Crossover mouse is one. And that's most likely to happen if they're far apart. If they're close together, the chance of them crossing over is minimal, becomes less and less likely. And so what they realize, if we look at the frequency of recombinants in this back cross, okay, that will tell us how far, far apart those genes are in the chromosome. And that's how they made their gene maps do what's called linkage analysis. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but let's look at these diagrams, maybe it'll help here. So here's the test cross parents. Here's the heterozygous female, okay? On one of her chromosomes, she's got both. So we see that both genes are the same chromosome. They're linked, they're physically linked together. Okay? When Mendel did this study, the, the gene that controlled seed texture and seed color were on different chromosomes. They always assort it independently. Okay, but now these two genes are the same chromosome, which means if I inherit this one, I'm probably going to get this one with it because they're physically attached. Okay, and she's heterozygous. She's got one chromosome that's got both wild type alleles, the other both recessive. She's heterozygous for both traits. Right? It's, it's a little tricky, and I hope I'm explaining it clearly. So she has this genotype, this test cross parent. Now we pair them up together. Okay, but the wild type alleles in the same chromosome, the, the mutant alleles on the, on the other chromosome she inherited from her double mutant father. Right? Here's the double mutant. The back cross, here she is mating with her father. <laughs> but he's He's a double mutant, so both his, now this is an autosome, it's not a set chromosome, they're homozygous recessive, so this is his genotype, right? Okay? When these comes are sorted in sex cells, okay, all his sex cells, all his sperm, doesn't matter which chromosome I get, they all carry both recessive alleles. But for the female, there's four combinations here. You can, you can pass the intact allele from her mother with both wild type alleles, or the intact chromosome from, from her father. You know, and then there's the recombination here at prophase one and meiosis one, crossover. Remember, I said crossover is kind of a random event. And, it's, and if you're the most are far apart, it's guaranteed to cross over every time. 
as their distance becomes shrinks, the chance that the crossover to have a line between diminishes. And so you can look at the frequency of these offspring, which means in this female, she's going to have, in terms of her eggs, she's got a lot more of these eggs than these two. Because these allele, because the crossover has to have been right in between, right in between these loci for these new combinations to happen. You look at the offspring numbers here. Okay? It's not one to one to one to one. It's mostly the parental types, which means most of the eggs fertilized were the result of a crossover that didn't happen in between here. They happened on either side. And so this frequency of recessives gives you a chance to measure, gives you a measure of this distance between these alleles. They were measured in what were called centimorgans. That was the unit they measured them in. Later, with molecular techniques, we convert a symptom organ into physical distance on the chromosome. But this is based on the frequency of the recessive individuals. So you had your total offspring of the back cross, 2,839. 2,534 were parentals, 305 were recombinants. That frequency, that's 100. That's the distance between those genes, according to these, this sort of linkage analysis. And by generating all kinds of mutants, they were able to generate these what were called linkage maps. They had four linkage maps that mapped to the four chromosomes. It may take you a while to grasp this. And so here's a partial map of these, some of these uh, mutants that they generated in the dentist's office. Here's the vestigial wing gene. There's the purple eye gene that's about 10 map units apart, okay? 